Thank you, Matt. That's great truth. First Thessalonians chapter 5, the greatest gift that has ever been given and the greatest gift, gift that's ever been received is the gift of salvation. I received that gift on September 15th, 1978, and we understand this morning that salvation is every bit a God thing, okay? It was, it was God's idea, it was God's plan, it was God's design, it's all God, and uh, there's nothing that I did uh, to earn salvation, there's nothing I can do to lose salvation, it's all God. Salvation uh, consists basically of three things, and we could add other things, but, but three basic elements. Uh, the first one <clears throat> is justification. <clears throat> justification. And justification is the declaring of a person to be just or righteous. All right? The Bible tells us in Romans, I think it's chapter 5, that uh, he was raised again for our justification. Justification. Someone used a little acronym. Just as if I'd never sinned. Justification. And that happened instantaneously. The moment you trusted Jesus as your Savior, He justified you. When He looks at you, if you have put your trust in Christ and His finished work, uh, at Calvary. When he looks at you, he sees righteousness. He has declared you to be just or to be righteous. There's another element to salvation. It's sanctification. Well, what is that? What is sanctification? Sanctification means to be set apart for the use intended by the designer, right? Um, we have been using this podium uh, because we're not using our choir and we put these banners up and uh, when everything goes back to normal, our, our pulpit will go back here. The pulpit, <clears throat> you could <clears throat> safely say that this pulp, our pulpit is sanctified. It has been set apart for a specific use. Uh, Brother John McKinney built the pulpit. Uh, it was designed, <clears throat> excuse me, it was, uh, in, it was set apart for, you, for a specific use intended by the designer. He knew what that was going to be used for when he designed it and built it. So there's justification. That happens instantaneously. Sanctification does not happen instantaneously. Sanctification is a process. Okay? And then there's glorification. And glorification is the ultimate perfection of believers. One day, <clears throat> when we are with him, we will receive our glorified bodies. What a wonderful day that'll be, right? And uh, we, we will, uh, when we see him, we will be like him and uh, glorification. Now, here's where we get in trouble. We tend to think that justification and glorification are what God does, and we erroneously conclude that sanctification is up to us. And that's a mistake. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. So God <clears throat> debunks our, our thought process that sanctification is up to us. God said, no, I do the sanctify. And uh, I, I noticed this passage uh, the other day when Tyler preached on Thanksgiving and I, I, I want to help you this morning. I want you to listen real closely. Here's the title of the message. Don't stop the sanctification. Don't stop the sanctification. You see, the same God who justified you will sanctify you. And the same God who sanctifies you will glorify you. 
However, there are some things that you can do that will prevent God from doing his work of sanctification in your life. And they're found here in this passage. All right, let's pray and we'll get into it. Father, I pray you'd help us and uh, teach us your word and instruct us. Uh, Lord, I should have mentioned earlier, there's a church, not, not locally, not a local church here, but a church that uh, is very dear to me personally, that's going through a very, very terrible, terrible situation. I pray that you would help them today, be with that pastor in a special way. And uh, Lord, I pray you would help us, uh, teach us and instruct us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So here's the deal, thank you, here's the deal, you cannot... You get saved. Okay, I got saved. I was justified the moment I got saved, right? And there's nothing I have to do. But, but, but God has a purpose. By the way, God did not just save you so that you would go to heaven. God has something he wants you to do here on the earth. All right? If he only saved you so that you'd go to heaven, he would have taken you to heaven the moment you got saved. Right? If that was the only reason, if that was the only part of it, he would have just said, hey, okay, hey, uh, you trust Christ and, and you put your faith in Jesus, boom, you're out of here. Sometimes that sounds pretty good, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. There's a few days in the last two weeks I was ready, man. <laughs> but, but here's the other side of it. I cannot get saved and just sit here and say, okay, God, sanctify me. Right. Now, he's the one that's going to do the work. But there are some things that I need to be sure that I don't do and some things I need to be sure that I do to allow him to do the work that only he can do. That's the, that's the subject of the message. Number one, if we're going to be sanctified, don't stop the sanctification. You've got to let the Holy Spirit do his work. Look, if you would, at verse 19. Very simple, four words. Verse 19, quench not the Spirit. Very short verse, very powerful words. We need to understand this morning that sanctification is a work that is done by the Holy Spirit of God. Full disclosure, I think as I look back over my life in ministry, I think there was a time in my ministry when I'm afraid that I tried to play the Holy Spirit in other people's lives. I tried to convict, thing, convict them of things that God had not spoken to them about. I, I, uh, I, I tried to produce conviction. I tried to dictate what was right or wrong for someone. I tried to govern how people ought to live. And I'll be honest with you, it usually took pretty well until those people were no longer under my care. But what I learned was, in many cases, they were simply acquiescing to my influence as a leader, and they had not responded to what the Holy Spirit of God does in their life. There was a time when I thought, you know, if I just yell a little louder, if I stomp my foot a few more times, if I clap my hands a few more times, if I tell a few more sad stories, if I get people all worked up emotionally, man, then they will become sanctified. That's wrong. That's wrong. God has given us someone called the Holy Spirit. You remember in, in, at the day of Pentecost when the Bible spoke about the movement of the Holy Ghost of God? It spoke of cloven tongues like fire. Now, <clears throat> in, in, in our passage, here's what he said, quench not the Spirit. What he's really saying is, don't you do anything to diminish the influence and the power and the effect of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. Don't do that. Don't do that. Let me give you a verse, a couple of verses, John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I will tell you the truth. It is expedient, Jesus is speaking here, for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, who is the Holy Ghost, will not come unto you. But if I depart, 
uh, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So the fire of God's Holy Spirit will come into my life and he will begin to change me. You know what he'll do? He'll convict me of my sin. He will reprove me when I am wrong. I can feel the burn when things aren't right in my life. But you know something? I have the power to stop all that. By quenching the Holy Spirit. Now here's the danger that I see with people. A lot of people today who are running around living lives that are contrary to the Bible say, well, God hasn't dealt with me about that. That what they're really saying is, I'm quenching the Holy Spirit in my life. See, those of you who want to live your way and you have your agenda and you have your little pet peeves, you can take this first point and say, see, God hasn't dealt with me about that. But is it possible you're lying? Is it possible that the Holy Ghost has, has worked and spoken and spoken and spoken and you just kept dumping water on the fire and dumping water on the fire until you have finally put the fire out? You have quenched the Spirit of God so it doesn't bother you anymore. No, He isn't speaking to you right now. You put the fire out. Yeah. If I'm going to become sanctified, if the process of sanctification is going to play out in my life, then I... I have got to let the Holy Spirit of God do his work. Here's a statement. You are never going to be sanctified until you are surrendered to letting the Holy Spirit do his work in your life. You're never going to be sanctified until you are surrendered to letting the Holy Spirit do his work in my life. That's what David was talking about when he said, search me, O God, and know my heart. God, see if there be any wicked way in me. God, let me know. Reveal that to me. That is a contrary position to those who quench the Spirit of God. I saw an illustration this week. It's not original, but I thought it was good. <clears throat> We're going to let this glove represent um, my life. My life. All right, so here's this. This is me. And I want... I want, this, I want this glove to pick up that bottle of water that Josh just brought me. I, I, I want this so I can say, look, that's your purpose. That's your purpose. Your purpose is to pick up that water right there. I'm thirsty. I need some help. Well, he, he's, he's not able to do that. He's not, as a matter of fact, he's not doing anything. So we say, well, I'll tell you what we need to do. We need to baptize him. Because if he were baptized, then that would... He would become the person that he needs to be. So I can take him up here and duck him in the water right here, but all I'm going to have is a soggy me. Is anybody listening? Yeah. It's just going to have a soggy me. It doesn't change anything. By the way, baptism doesn't, doesn't change you. Once in a while, somebody will make an erroneous statement. Uh, Jesus washed my sins away, and they're referring to a baptismal pool. That water came from the city of Durham. There's nothing holy about it. Okay? Well, that didn't work. So I know what we need to do. We need some discipleship. That's what we need. We need to get this glove around some other gloves. Because if we get this glove spending time with other gloves, then he'll just kind of catch on to what he needs to do to get that bottle of water. But you, you can put this in a basket of 500 gloves. But it doesn't change anything. This glove will only fulfill its purpose. When something knows someone else takes up residence. And whenever I put my hand in this glove, I can pick up a bottle of water. I can do whatever I want to do. I, 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 I had, that's where the power is. Listen to me. The power in your life to make you the person that God wants you to be is not through rituals or tradition or baptism or catechism or scripture memory. That's not where the power is. The power is when the person of the Holy Spirit indwells you. 
Well, here's what we do. We say, okay, Holy Spirit, you can, you can enter, you can enter this part of my life right here, this one, you can enter that. But, but these other areas, you really need to stay out of those. I don't need you tell, I don't need you convicting me about my music. That's none of your business. I don't need you convicting me about how I dress and how I live. That's none of your business. I don't need you convicting me about my associations. That's none of your business. You know what? Right now, I'm, I can't pick up anything. I can't even pick my nose. Oh, I want to be everything God wants me to be. Number one, let the Holy Spirit do his work. Let him do his work. Number two, make much of preaching. Make much of preaching. It's right here in the passage. Look at verse 20. Despise not prophesying. Now, when we hear the word prophesy, we equate that to prophecy. And most of the time we think about the book of Revelation. And, uh, and a lot of people <clears throat> are real attracted to prophetical preaching. And uh, some of the people that I have known through the years who were so attracted to prophetical preaching, I think they would rather hear about what God is going to do someday than what they need to be doing in their life today. Okay. It really doesn't matter who the Antichrist is if you're not reading your Bible every day. It really doesn't matter what all the toes on the beast mean if you're not, if you're not, if you're not living in this book right here. But when, that, when God uses that word prophesying there, Meyer said this. It, when he, speaking of prophesying, he said its nature consisted not so much in the prediction of future events, which is what we think of, although that was not excluded. As in energetic, soul-captivating, and intelligent expression of what was directly communicated by the Holy Ghost to the speaker for the edification and moral elevation of the church. That's kind of busy, but basically what they're saying was, when he says despise not prophesying, he's talking about what we're doing right now. That's what he's talking about. You say, well, I want to be sanctified, pastor. I want to be all that God wants me to be. Okay, you got to make much of preaching, period. Yeah. There is no way around that, period. you got to make much of preaching. I believe you could safely say here in this passage that Paul is speaking about the importance of the preaching of the Word of God. It is the Spirit that sanctifies. It is the Spirit that sets us apart. It is the Spirit that does the work in us. But God has always used the vehicle of preaching to aid in the process. Can I ask you a question this morning? What's your attitude toward preaching? Not toward the preacher. Toward preaching. Let me give you a verse. 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. It is the preaching of the cross is the key that turns on the engine. It is the power of God. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is a key entity in the process of sanctification. But you know what? The average person that names the name of Christ, they can take or leave it. They don't think anything about missing. They come and don't pay attention. They look for ways, excuses to get out of preaching services. Oh, God, you do something in my life. God said, despise not prophesy. The word despise there, the word despise there, it, it, it basically means to disdain, to think nothing of it. It's not important. Some people never grow in sanctification because they don't see the importance of it or they dismiss it. Let me give you another verse. We're going to move on. Stick with me. 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the same verse. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Unsaved people don't get this. But saved people, God said, it's the power of God unto salvation. 
You got to have it. The word despise, I got ahead of myself. It means to dismiss it or to count it as nothing, to render it as useless. We even, we, myself, we even crack jokes about it. Here's what we say. Oh, he's just preaching. And that's why some of you are not growing in your Christian life. It's not because you don't go to church. It's not because you don't have good attendance. It's because it's just preaching. But my Bible says it's the power of God unto salvation. So if I'm going to become sanctified, I've got to let the Holy Ghost do His work. I, I've got to make much of preaching. Number three, I've got to embrace the truth. Look at verse 21. Prove all things. What does that mean? Prove. It means to recognize as genuine after close examination. So when you hear something preached, here's a good question to ask. Does that align with Scripture? Because there's a lot that goes on today in the name of preaching by some even in our circles that it doesn't really align with the Word of God. This, I'm wearing a ring <coughs> that was my father's several weeks ago. I, uh, I took it to a jeweler. You know why? Because I wanted to know. I, I wanted to know, is, is this legit? I knew it was legit, but is, is, this, is this real? Is, are these diamonds, what's the quality of these diamonds? What, what's, the, what's the grade on this gold? Now, I could pass it around the auditorium. We could all give opinions, but none of those matter. None of those matter. And see, here's what we do. We all give our opinions about preaching. We give our opinions about Bible interpretation. But can I just tell you this? None of those matter. <clears throat> well, I heard this guy say one time, okay, prove all things. How does it line up with Scripture? Because the reality is, my opinion about this ring didn't matter, but the jeweler's opinion matters greatly. John 4.1, 1 John 4.1 says this, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So I hear preaching. I let the Holy Spirit do His work in my life. I don't quench the Spirit. I hear preaching. I make sure that it lines up with Scripture. And when I find out that it does, here's what I do. I embrace it. I embrace it. You got to embrace the truth. You say, I want to grow, Pastor. I want to grow. I want to become a better Christian. You've got to embrace the truth. Here's what he said prove all things, hold fast that which is good. That word good there, it means fine in quality. It's the real deal, it's legitimate, it's biblical. Number four, and the last point. So I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do his work, I'm not going to quench him. I'm going to listen to preaching, but, but, but what else? Okay, look with me. Hey, it's biblical, right? It's biblical preaching. I'm going to hold fast to the good, but then I'm going to go one step further. Look at verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil. So in this process of sanctification... I, in my life, have tried to determine that I'm going to go a step further. Obviously, I'm going to abstain from evil because it's declared evil by the Word of God. But if I want God to do a great work of sanctification in my life, and I want to be all that He wants me to be, and I want to please Him in all things, if there's an area in my life that may not be evil, but that could appear as evil to someone else, I'm going to abstain from that as well. You people, show me a chapter and verse. That's, 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 I, I, we test it by the word of God. But you know, there's some things in my life that are, are not commandment based, they're principle based. Yeah. Let me give you an example. I, I, 
I don't drink, and I believe the, I believe the Word of God teaches abstinence. But, but you know something else I'm not going to do? I'm not going to sit at the bar to eat a hamburger. I'm not going to do that. I walked in a place one time. You can tell him I told you. And it was lunchtime. And uh, it was out here at Briar Creek. I don't remember which, which restaurant. But I walked in and John Krayshack was sitting at the bar. I said, John, how you doing, man? <laughs> he said, preacher, it was just much quicker. I said, you don't owe me an explanation, dude. It's okay. It's all right. And, and I'm not being critical of John, but for me, I don't, I don't want to take a chance that someone would come in and think that I was sitting at the bar having a drink. I, I'm going to be very careful how I dress and what I wear. Do you, you know what I want to be careful about? I want to be careful that in an effort to be fashionable and trendy, that I do not dress in a way that is embraced and endorsed by people of lifestyles that are contrary to the Word of God. Okay, let me, let me make it real simple. <laughs> Are you, is this any good? Is this helping you at all? Okay, we're almost done. So I'm going to put you out of your misery here in a minute. When, when Genesis talked about a rainbow and God put a rainbow in the sky and it was a promise, right? That he would never again destroy the, the world with water, right? But there is a segment of our society who have adopted that symbol as their symbol. So let me just help you. You're probably never going to see a rainbow on a Fellowship Baptist Church logo. Right? That's common sense. Because someone would look at that and they wouldn't think the flood. They would think the homosexuals. There's nothing wrong with a rainbow. As a matter of fact, it was God who did that. Amen. But I, I would never put a rainbow license plate on the front of my truck. Right. I'd never put a rainbow sticker on the back of my truck. Right. Why? Because I want to abstain from the appearance of evil. Right. Now, I know how I feel about a rainbow. Yeah. But I don't know how that guy behind me at the traffic light feels about a rainbow. Right. So... Because I want God to do a thorough work in my life, I'll abstain from that. I was at the suit store yesterday. I, we were doing a little bit of shopping. And the lady was helping me. My wife was trying to help me get some ties, and the salesman was there. The lady was doing the markings for the alterations and something I don't remember babe if it was a tie or what and oh I know what it was we were trying to decide whether to wear a cuff to do to cuff the pants or just to put a hem in them and I said well what's my wife said well what's everybody doing now what's what's everybody doing now and the lady said well no one right now no one ever comes in and asks for cuffs anymore and I said well I want to be trendy and the guy who always helps me there started laughing <laughs> I said, because Gary, you know I'm a real trendy guy. I said, now I'm not quite trendy enough for skinny jeans. That's a horrible word picture. But you know what? I, I do try to be careful. That, that what is going, I'm careful about what I put on social media. What kind of music I put on social media. I'm careful about steak. I've gotten in trouble. I've gotten in trouble by, by sharing something and finding out it had profanity in it. And so what he says here is you want God to do the work of sanctification in your life? Then don't just avoid evil. 
but abstain from the appearance of evil. Now, hear me out. I'm, I'm done. You've, done. you've listened so well. I hadn't preached to you in two weeks. I got to get I got a lot of catching up to do. I think, I think that my decision to live that way has much to do with my heart attitude toward God. You say, what do you mean? It's not about the letter of the law, and it's not about what God demands, and it's not about what is required. It's not even about what others think about me. But it is me saying to my God that I love him enough that I would never want to be misunderstood by anyone when it comes to my allegiance to my Savior and my commitment to his word. And if that makes me crazy, just call me crazy. And if he's not important to you, if he's not that important to you, then I wonder if the work of sanctification will truly be accomplished in your life. You see, me not eating a burger at the bar is not just about my image, but it's about his image. It's about his image. I would never want anyone to think that I don't love him enough to abstain from some things. Let me finish. If you're just trying to get God off your back, if you're just trying to appease him, if you're trying, just trying to get by, then the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is going to be limited in your life. You say, well, hey, so does that really matter? Because if I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, right? Absolutely. And, and, and I'm not going to have to forfeit my ticket if I live inappropriately, will I? No. No, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. It's according to his mercy he saved us. But let me give you two verses. Illustration, I'm done. 2 Timothy 2.20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. And some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Amen. Sanctification, it means to be set apart for a specific purpose intended by the designer. It means to be consecrated to God. If you, don't, if you don't believe this, that's, that's your business. But I just happen to believe that wherever I'm at in this process of sanctification, the more sanctified I am, the more usable I am. Yes. There was an elderly lady. Her health was failing and she went on a trip with her family. True story. Their journey brought them to some road construction. For miles and miles, they passed barricades and traffic cones and heavy equipment. A detour took them off of the highway onto a two-lane road, and for several miles, they sat in stop-and-go traffic. As they merged back onto the interstate, there was a sign that read, End of construction. Thank you for your patience. This elderly lady from the back seat said to her family, that sign right there, that's what I want on my tombstone. Yeah. End of construction. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. If we were to get in the car and go to Charlotte, North Carolina, to the Billy Graham Library, yeah. you'll find a simple headstone with those words inscribed upon it. End of construction. Thank you for your patience. It's Mrs. Billy Graham's tombstone. Yeah. You know what she was saying by requesting that be on her headstone? We're all the work in progress. Yeah. And we fall short. And we fail each other. And we fail God. But he's still working on us. Amen. And I don't want to do anything yeah. to limit. I, I'm, I can't sanctify myself. It's not about, it's not about. It's not about me changing my life. I can't hardly change my socks. 
It's about me letting God do his work of sanctification in me. Father, I pray you'd help us.